The 1930s marked a very important time for science fiction. It was the start of its golden age, which would go on between this point in time all the way throughout the 50s. A time when technology would continue to evolve and real world events would influence how stories would be made. What resulted were all sorts of strange but fun pulp science fiction stories that also featured colorful artwork depicting bizarre, exciting, and thrilling scenes of robots, aliens, and of course, dinosaurs. The true start of the Golden Age is a little hard to pinpoint, but during the 20s, the genre was popularized by different magazines specifically dedicated to showcasing science fiction and fantasy stories, like Weird Tales and Amazing Stories. Hugo Gernsback, the original creator of the Amazing Stories magazine, was let go from his time working on it, forcing him to seek other outlets of showcasing science fiction stories which he eventually would through a new magazine he formed called Wonder Stories in 1929, which would go on until 1955. Obviously, there's a lot of history here with these different science fiction magazines, but I'm keeping it condensed for the sake of brevity. It would actually be this magazine where I would end up finding yet another dinosaur story that I wanted to make its own video on because of how weird and hectic it was. It's definitely a contrast from last week's story, I'll tell you that much. This story was called One Prehistoric Night, and its first appearance was on the 1934 November issue of Wonder Stories. In fact, it also featured as the cover art for that issue, which presents a very cool visual of what to expect for later in the story. The cover art, along with the page art, was made by Frank R. Paul, who was the art editor for the magazine. The story itself was written by Philip Barshofsky, who doesn't seem to have much of a footprint in the world of science fiction, or anywhere really. As far as I can see, his only credits of any of his work that I can find are two science fiction short stories, both of which he had written for Wonder Stories. That of course being One Prehistoric Night, and the other being The Imperfect Guest, which I think featured in 1936. Regardless, this dude would write a very interesting take on the whole aliens versus dinosaurs plot that we've seen in stories like this before. So to give you a bit of a summary, the story is about a group of aliens that travel to a prehistoric Earth during the Jurassic period to set up camp on the planet to scope out whether or not it's livable for their species, who are a part of a dying home planet. Of course, things start to go wrong when the dinosaurs of this point in time get a little too curious and close to the aliens, which inevitably leads to conflict. Now, if you're a longtime viewer of this channel or are just very interested in these retro science fiction dinosaur stories, you'll probably think that the plot of One Prehistoric Night sounds awfully familiar with another story called Death of the Moon from the Amazing Stories magazine in 1929, which also featured aliens traveling to a prehistoric Earth in search of a livable home for the rest of their species. Of course, the stories are still different from each other in different aspects, but it's kind of a funny comparison, especially when you consider the history between Amazing Stories and Wonder Stories. Hugo Gernsback, who originally launched Amazing Stories, lost control of his magazine due to a bankruptcy lawsuit directed at his publication outlets, which there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of information on, but regardless, he decided to continue down the route of publishing science fiction stories through magazines as he would launch a couple of more under the name of Science Wonder Stories and Air Wonder Stories, which he would eventually just combine together to make the Wonder Stories magazine. A part of me likes to think that One Prehistoric Night was purposely made to be somewhat similar to Death of the Moon out of spite from Gernsback, who probably didn't like that he was pushed out of his own initial magazine, but that's nothing more than me just kind of jokingly speculating about it. I don't, th that shouldn't be taken seriously. I don't necessarily think that was actually the case. At the end of the day, these weren't Gernsback's stories. He didn't write them. He just put them in his magazine to publish, so who knows, maybe Barshavsky was just just inspired by Alexander Phillips' story and used it as a template for his own. Or maybe they both just happen to have the same alien meets dinosaurs kind of concepts for their story. I don't really know, but regardless, we're left with a very interesting story. So let's not wait any longer. Let's take a look at One Prehistoric Night. The story starts off with a torpedo-shaped rocket emerging from the horizon and landing in a clearing of a remote island. 
When the ship quiets down, what can be heard are the loud footsteps and the hissing and shrieking of prehistoric creatures in the distance, because while the passengers in the ship didn't know it now, they landed on Earth during its late Jurassic period. The noise of the ship's landing had actually attracted an Allosaurus, which curiously stands behind the tree line to the clearing, debating whether or not to go up to the strange new object or to go off somewhere else to hunt. But it ends up being distracted by more loud noises in the distance. Noises of a fight for life and food, which is enough to attract the Allosaurus. But it wasn't just the Allosaurus it attracted. It's not specified what dinosaurs are in battle, but it does make it clear that one of them has died and that the sound of the dying animal ends up attracting all sorts of creatures from the area, both big and small. The ground heaved and trembled as from all over creatures hurried toward the scene of the battle. Soon the foggy air was filled with the shrilling and screaming of the hungry monsters of an infant planet. The segment ends with all of the dinosaurs rushing to feast on the one that had lost the battle and in the process, the larger carnivores are so eager and distracted to get to the corpse that they end up carelessly crushing the smaller carnivores to death under their heavy footsteps. This whole beginning segment is foreshadowing to the kind of chaos that ensues with these carnivores when there's conflict nearby that may result in food for them. While they're busy eating, the doors of the rocket ship finally open, revealing a strange alien creature. It stands upright, only about four feet tall. It has a total of six limbs, four arms, and two legs, and at the end of its four arms were three fingered hands. Its attire consists of an orange skull cap it wears on its head, a green metal tunic that it wears for its body, and a belt that holds all of its weird alien gadgets. The alien calls out to its companions inside the ship and they venture around the area. In terms of communication, the aliens actually whistle at each other. Apparently, due to the thin air of their home planet, they are forced to whistle at high notes to be able to hear each other, and because they were so used to these very loud high notes, the aliens couldn't hear a lot of the lower noises of the new planet. Anyways, as they continue exploring, they also explain the purpose for their arrival. Their home planet, which is Mars, I believe, is becoming uninhabitable for their species. So in their last efforts to try and save themselves from complete extinction, a group had been sent out on a spaceship to find a new planet that's suitable to house them and their colony. One of the aliens takes notice of the new planet's viable resources and living conditions. It has a clean atmosphere, plenty of water that can be converted to drinking water, and active healthy soil. Much better than the conditions of their home planet, which is explained to have suffered from years of warfare that has contaminated a lot of what they need to survive. Which explains why they made this trip to Earth in the first place, but the explanation doesn't really seem to go beyond that. It's mainly just implied that constant war had made their planet unlivable. Regardless, they seem to like the conditions of Earth, but are still questioning what kind of life resides here. They hear all sorts of strange sounds coming from the jungles that surround them, but they don't seem to be worried. They had brought the right means of defense and fortification to account for any hostile organisms that may live on the planet. They set up an electric fence around the perimeter of the clearing, and they build a large tower with a platform on top that holds a mounted electron gun being manned by one of the aliens. For now, they're safe from the deadly creatures of the jungle. What's interesting about this story is that a good chunk of it is actually focused on the life of the dinosaurs, more specifically the deadly conflicts that happen between the dinosaurs and the normalization of death that occurs within their everyday lives. For example, as the aliens continue working on their new base, the story shifts back to the dinosaurs, more specifically the Allosaurus fighting a sauropod dinosaur. You can definitely get an idea of when the story was written because it goes on to explain that the sauropod dinosaur is unable to to actively defend itself because it was a slow mover on land, so it desperately made its way towards the water to get away from the Allosaurus. In case you didn't know, that used to be a common belief where it was thought sauropods spent most of their times in swamps and lakes because they struggled to carry their own heavy weight and relied on living in the water to help them out with that. Until around the 1970s, I believe during the dinosaur renaissance, studies showed that they were actually suited to 
live their lives primarily on land. So the sauropod makes its way towards a lake with the allosaurus following it, and when they leave the area, a diplodocus ventures into the same area, also on its way to the lake to get some water. And it accidentally steps on a small animal in the process, but continues on its way, oblivious to what it had just done. I think it's just trying to emphasize that death occurs anywhere at any time, even from creatures that don't mean to cause it. Like the diplodocus, who was simply just trying to find some water to drink. The story then shifts to a group of newly hatched baby reptiles of some kind that just kind of play around with each other and eat small insects around the area. Then, almost out of nowhere, a larger insect comes in and snaps up one of the babies and disappears with it. With the rest of the babies paying no attention to or caring about the fact that one of their siblings had just been snatched by a large bug at all. Then the segment ends with our attention on a Morosaurus, which was thought to be its own sauropod species before it was realized to be synonymous with Camarasaurus. But in this story, they just call it a Morosaurus, so I'm just gonna stick to that. Anyways, in the story, the Morosaurus was running away from an unnamed carnivorous monster, as the story describes, by running into the ocean outside of the island. While it was safe from its attacker from land, it was not safe from the one in the ocean, as the Morosaurus gets attacked by a large shark that bites its tail off. It was in a pretty tough spot, as it was unable to get back to land, and the blood of its wound had attracted several other carnivorous fish that eat at its flesh. Even if it did manage to make it out of the water, the Morosaurus's original pursuer was still waiting for it on land, indicating that it most likely wouldn't have made it no matter what it did. Again, the whole segment is meant to show off the brutality and chaos of this world, even if it's just completely over-exaggerated. The story is a product of its time, and during this point in time, dinosaurs in these science fiction stories, especially the carnivorous ones, were almost always depicted as monsters that were always always hungry and hunting down the innocent and helpless herbivorous dinosaurs that always struggle to defend themselves. It comes off as if that was their normal behavior, and as a result, the time of the dinosaurs were always filled with chaos and death. I mean, that's still depicted a bit in modern dinosaur media, but probably not to the same extent as these pulp science fiction stories. These stories tended to get more crazy, and it does get a little crazy later on in this one, but we'll get to that. Back at the encampment, the aliens continue working, setting up their living quarters, putting up tall light towers, studying some of the wildlife, and so on. As they continue working, a brontosaurus makes its way into the clearing and up to the fence which makes the aliens nervous enough to attack the dinosaur by using their ray guns to keep it from destroying it. But the blasts of their weapons were too weak to cause any kind of fatal effect to the animal, only leaving behind burn spots on its skin. So the alien on top of the gun tower aims the electron gun at the brontosaurus and fires at it, which ends up stopping the animal right in its tracks. Then, I kid you not, the brontosaurus literally turns into a pile of worms, with a stupendous roar that absolutely rocked the surrounding forest and caused hundreds of creatures to fall where they stood, an invisible stream of electrons shot out of the muzzle of the gun, just as it, the brontosaurus, was about to crash the puny wire safety. The reptile halted in its tracks, its mouth opened to howl in agony, but no sound issued forth from that gigantic throat. Its body began to change visibly to a greenish color. It began to shiver. Then, from a terrible dinosaur, Brontosaurus became a mass of struggling worms. When I first read that part, I thought it was supposed to be some kind of metaphor or maybe a weird expression or a joke, but no. These aliens actually turned a 30-ton animal into a pile of literal worms. It's actually somewhat explained how this worked. Apparently, the gun that they used to cause this launches a loose flow of electrons, hence why it's called an electron gun, which causes molecular metamorphosis at whatever the gun is targeted at, and depending on what mode the gun is in, will transform their target from one organism to another, or in this case, many other organisms. But this wasn't the only run-in they would have with the prehistoric wild wildlife, as in that same night, several more encounters were made. The first one was a Morosaurus, who didn't really do anything. More than anything, it just seemed curious of the encampment, but this didn't stop the aliens from being on guard, and they hoped that it would just kind of go away. 
But then, as they were distracted by this dinosaur, two more would come out from different parts of the jungle without them noticing. One of them being an Allosaurus, and the other being a Stegosaurus. The Allosaurus had seen and was hunting the Morosaurus, while the Stegosaurus was simply just trying to cross the clearing to get to its feeding grounds. The Allosaurus would go after the Morosaurus, which would result in a huge battle between the two dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the Stegosaurus, in a state of fear, would charge right into the electric fence, which unsurprisingly kills and chars the animal. But, you know, since the Stegosaurus ran into the fence, it would damage it as well, and in order to repair it, the aliens had to shut off the electrical current, leaving them and their base completely vulnerable. Their only means of defense at this point was their electron gun that was mounted on their watchtower, which seemed to be the only thing that could actually stop these large dinosaurs. As the Allosaurus and Morosaurus continued their battle, things only got much worse. You'll remember from earlier in the story, the Allosaurus, along with several other carnivorous dinosaurs, had heard a battle in the distance and followed it as it could result in an easy meal for them. Well, the same thing was happening here. The battle between the Allosaurus and the Morosaurus was attracting several unwanted carnivorous visitors towards the clearing, right where the aliens and their now unprotected base was. The Allosaurus was winning this battle against the Morosaurus, and as it was on top of the sauropod dinosaur, the Morosaurus ends up losing its sense of direction and runs right into the aliens' encampment and into their rocket ship, causing it to tip over on its side. The side of the ship would grab the Allosaurus' curiosity as it maybe thought it was more prey or something of the like, because it would end up pouncing on it and damaging the exterior of the ship. As it was doing that, the aliens aimed their electron gun at it and fired, hitting and turning the theropod dinosaur into a pile of worms. But among the tree line emerged several other carnivorous dinosaurs, all heading straight for the encampment. This is when all hell broke loose. Cold-blooded monstrosities of various sizes with empty bellies face the alien horde, as if accusing them of trying to wrest from nature a world that did not belong to them. Not a second did these hungry creatures waste. With one accord, they surged forward. The dinosaurs broke through the fence and into the encampment. The aliens attempted to fight off what they could with the weapons they had to no avail. Some were ripped apart by the smaller carnivores, others were killed by the larger insects that had initially been attracted to all of the worms that came from the dinosaurs that were shot by the electron gun, and the fencing, the light towers, and the other alien-made structures had been toppled over by the incoming horde. Soon, the alien's only real form of defense at this point, that being the electron gun, would become completely out of commission after an insect would get itself stuck inside, causing it to malfunction. Soon, the entire scene of the encampment was a combination of a horde of animals eating the large now-dead Morosaurus from earlier in the battle, animals eating each other or the worms from those unfortunate enough to get shot by the electron gun, and animals killing and eating the rest of the surviving aliens. Some tried to escape to the ship, others tried making a stand against the dinosaurs, but either way both would fail and the rest of the night was filled with the roars of the hungry dinosaurs and the whistling of the dying aliens. I think it's safe to say that there were no alien survivors that night, and because these alien scouts never returned to their home planets, the rest of their race assumed that Earth was uninhabitable for them as well. They never did seem to find out what happened to that scouting mission though, and as far as what would end up happening to the rest of the alien race, the story never really explains. The story ends with one final short segment which takes place much later into the future, when what used to be an overran encampment of aliens and dinosaurs was now a graveyard of bones from said organisms. In the final words of the story, it says, Here and there lay the round skull of a Martian, a skull that denoted intelligence. A skull that was a sort of prediction that seemed to foretell of a species that would, millions of years in the future, rule the Earth. Stupid earthly creatures had preserved the world for earthly intelligence to come eons later. 
What I really like about One Prehistoric Night is that it incorporates dinosaurs into a science fiction concept that I feel is very underutilized despite its potential. Dinosaurs are incorporated into science fiction media in tons of different ways, through time travel and lost worlds, through being artificially created in a lab or some result of an experiment gone wrong, but aliens encountering dinosaurs is always an interesting idea, even if sometimes it's not always executed properly. I think One Prehistoric Night is an absolute crazy and wild rendition of this idea, and for that, I really like it. Personally, I think in terms of just straight pulp science fiction stories, Death of the Moon did the concept a bit better. The T-Rex, from what I remember, didn't feel as monstrous and the story was a bit more grounded. At the end of the day though, it was still a pulp science fiction story and was still pretty crazy in its own right. But One Prehistoric Night takes things one step further in like, literally everything. The carnivorous dinosaurs are constantly on the attack. The aliens' technology is literally able to turn their enemies into worms. There's hordes of dinosaurs that unleash into an all-out battle with the aliens to get to a sauropod carcass. So yeah, you know, compared to Death of the Moon, this story goes off the deep end just, uh, just a tad. Really, it's probably nothing in the world of pulp science fiction stories since a lot of them tend to be pretty bizarre and wild in general. For me, it's sometimes surreal to see dinosaurs in these kinds of weird scenarios because dinosaurs are much more of a grounded element to these stories than anything else, due to the fact that they've existed in this world before, they were real at one point. But that's not a bad thing, at least not to me. I think dinosaurs being used in these kinds of ideas just shows how versatile they can be in science fiction. Also, I think it's just cool how they decided to set the story in the Jurassic period. Again, there are many ways these kinds of stories incorporate dinosaurs into them, and when there are that have their setting in a prehistoric point in time, it feels like it's typically aimed for the Cretaceous because obviously it has a lot more fan favorites in there. It's nice to see a little focus on a different time period. Period, with even some lesser known dinosaurs like Morosaurus and Diplodocus thrown in there. I mean, I say that, but of course, the cover art contradicts that a bit, since it has some Cretaceous dinosaurs in there, including a Protoceratops and a T Rex that's very obviously a reference to that one Charles Knight painting, and so on. But you know what? The story doesn't mention these guys at all, so they aren't canon, and uh, you, you can't change my mind on that. Anyways, at the end of the day, I think this story is a fun, wild ride, and if you enjoy weird pulp science fiction stories, I recommend this one to you, and if you want to read it, I'll have it linked in the description down below. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you all so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.